<clears throat> Intro. Welcome back to another episode of the First Customer Club. We're figuring out how to find customers and get traction as fast as possible. And if you're Mr. Cater, it's more like how do you find 100 customers in three days? TK Cater is a serial SaaS entrepreneur with multiple exits. He founded Tout App and sold it to Marketo, or as I like to call it, Marketo. Then he joined the executive team at Marketo and helped sell that business unit to Adobe for 4.75 billion with a capital B. He's the famous author of an Amazon bestseller and he's a quite famous SaaS coach helping entrepreneurs to build their businesses and become unstoppable. Such a great name, why didn't I think of that? And if you wanna know why I'm using cue cards and slamming my fists every three seconds, then check out his YouTube channel. I couldn't make this stuff up. In this episode, we'll jump into the story of TK's earliest days building Tout App, including the tactics and setup he used to get to product market fit in three days. So watch this episode if you wanna learn how to validate your startup really fast, the best way to get meaningful product feedback, how to choose the right startup for you, advice for founders to figure out their ideal customer profile faster, how to build and position products your customers need as opposed to just want, and three other super juicy questions. What was it like working with Ray Dalio of Bridgewater, one of the largest hedge funds in the world? What was it like sitting in the same boardroom as Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz of Andreessen Horowitz, his famous VCs, and TK's personal opinion that startups are supposed to be easy? A little late to be telling you that one, TK. So in the words of Mr. TK, smash that like button, drop a heck yes in the comment section, go microwave some popcorn, and enjoy the show! Hey TK, how are you? I'm well, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. Um, very rarely do I get to find someone who's also a fan of the Matrix movie. <laughs> I love the Matrix, yeah. Did you hear they're coming up with another movie? They're doing it again. Are they really? Yeah. See, I, as much as I love the Ma Matrix is awesome, I will admit my number one is Star Trek, Star Trek Next Generation. And I've been excited about Picard coming back. And if, there were, if they would just do another Star Trek movie, like that would just make me so happy. I think they would probably bring a lot of people back. I feel isolated from Star Trek. I've joined the Star Wars era, but I think that movie would crush. I like specifically how you use the analogy of the bullets that Neo stops mid-flight. Uh, you tie that into meditation. Um, I want to use this chance to ask you, why do you meditate and what it does for you? Because I've never tried it, and maybe you can convince me. Yeah, uh, I, I've been practicing a specific type of meditation for about 10 years now. It's called transcendental meditation. And the way it works is you have to go through a training and they give you a mantra. It's a wor nonsensical word. And uh, for 20 minutes, you focus on that nonsensical word and then you calm down. Like you just kind of ease off of it for three minutes because it does help. Ch it does change your brain patterns as you're, as you're doing it. And I got into it because I was working at Bridgewater, which is one of the largest hedge funds in the world. And Ray Dalio, who was the founder of Bridgewater, swore by it. He was just like, there's one thing I attribute to, it's transcendental meditation. And it's like when, a, when someone as successful as Ray Dalio is like, you should do this one thing, you know, you're gonna do that one thing. And so that's how I learned it. And uh, I, the, re, the value that I get is what it trains you to do is when a bunch of things are coming your way, it trains you to stop, pause, and pick the most essential thing to focus on. And as you mentioned, I, I equate that to the matrix. It's like the Neo learning, he doesn't need to dodge bullets, which are all the things that are coming at you in a given day. He eventually learns by the end of the movie that he can stop the bullets, look sideways, pick the bullet that matters the most and let the rest fall. And if you could do that as you go through the course of your day as a billion things are coming your way, would you, would you want me to teach you how to do that? Like how to fix that? Yeah, hundred percent. So I, I, I guess, I guess it's a technique for managing stress and I get at the end of the, I guess at the end of the day, it's a technique for how you focus too, right? Because as a SaaS founder, million things going on and that's what we're going to jump into a bit more today. So 
Um, yeah, I actually want to start. Uh, I want to start. I guess towards the end, just to just to just to give everybody a sense as to who you are and what you've done. Um, you sold Tout App to Marketo. You sold Marketo to Adobe for what? Marketo. What for? Yeah. Everyone, everyone gets that wrong. It's it's okay. It, it's Marketo. 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 I didn't enunciate. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, I, I never even thought about it until people get it wrong. I'm like, should I correct them? It doesn't matter, but kind of, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds richer the way you say it. So at Maybe. the end of the day, you, you, you built that up. You had the experience basically going from absolute scratch to selling something for $1.4 billion. Um, I, knew- uh, well, no, I want to be clear. I didn't sell anything for one point four. So I, I started Tout App. Uh, and then we grew it and then we sold it to Marketo and then I started on the executive team at Marketo uh, and then we sold Marketo to Adobe for 4.75 billion. Well, you had the experience of seeing something all the way through and noticing the problems at the first days of product market fit all the way to at the executive level, how you actually move a solution to a larger org. So that, that's a really cool story. Um, when you actually sold what you had built, Tout App, um, I always imagine that moment in that boardroom where you actually, you know, sign the papers virtually where your lawyer says to somebody else's lawyer, like, are we good to go? Yes, green light. Do you remember what that moment was like for you that first time that you realized, you know, it was your second company you had sold most recent, you know, experience there? What, what was that boardroom like? Yeah, uh, so it's it's funny. It felt, uh, so it totally felt like I was getting married because uh, it was me and my VP of um, biz ops and finance, uh, Leo. So we were together in the room, uh, and it was all virtual. It was dial in. So we dialed in. Marketo people had dialed in. The Vista people had dialed in. The lawyers had dialed in. And there was this one person that was like, "All right, do you TK agree to release the funds and?" consider the completion of the deal and i was like i i do and then there was someone else like do you at marketo uh agree to the release of the funds and agree and they were like i do and i was literally i blurted out a serious moment where like i just feel like i just got married and i'm divorced so i'm like you know i i take, I take it very seriously uh so it, it was it was surreal uh you know you do it because you had been working at that point we hadn't slept in three weeks because the due diligence was so crazy to get the deal done uh, we had, it was just me and Leo on our side and there was the private equity firm, there was the Marketo people and there was two independent auditing firms that were just combing through every aspect of the deal. We had a 300 point checklist, Excel spreadsheet to like do all the things to get the deal done. Uh, it was insane. Uh, but at that moment we were like, oh my God, it's done. Thank God. That type of thing. So it was great. It felt, it felt good. Wow. What, what a roller coaster. So, um, so to go with the absolute opposite end of that spectrum, um, what started that initial roller coaster? I understand that you you were working on a piece of IP that ended up becoming Tout App. That was what you were doing with Brain Trust, right? Um, could, yeah. could you maybe share what what you had been thinking about working on? What was kind of that that piece of property that first kicked off what became the company Tout App? Yeah, so I was working on a, on a very different idea called Brain Trust. And Brain Trust was essentially uh, an online private community where you could have group discussions. And it was for your team or for a club. And so you would sign up, you create a group, it's called the Brain Trust. You would invite people in and you would have discussions. And, uh, and the whole point of it was group discussions over email is not very good, so you should be able to do it uh, on a centralized place. And at that time, Facebook groups wasn't as big and people still didn't trust Facebook back then. Emails were, mailing lists were like the rage. And so we're like, there needs to be a place that's you own and you can just host these discussions. The problem was it tried to get people to change behavior. And it was a period of time where social networks were still all about the feed and not about private groups. Like over Mm. the last 10 years, they've really switched from the feed to private groups where there's smaller communities. So we were a little bit early. So it wasn't going anywhere and I kept adding more features and kept adding more features. I fell into what I teach my founders, which is the one more feature trap. It's like you keep convincing yourself that if you just had one more feature, this one feature, then it's going to go boom. And I kept adding more features, kept adding, and finally I was like, you know, what? I just need to email people 
and tell them that this thing exists. And it was ironic because on one hand, I was trying to replace email. On the other hand, I, I, I wanted to send more emails to drive growth because, you know, email will never die. Right. So I created this thing. I copied the, the code for the landing page, the billing system, and the home page. And I just created this thing over the course of a weekend called Pitch. And Pitch was this thing where you could just log in, you could pick a template, and you can customize it, and boom, it would send out an outbound email. It was well, just a web people, app, right? It was just a web app. If I remember, you, you couldn't even put bold or italicized, right? That's right. You can't, we couldn't bold anything. Uh, it was just plain text email. And it, you couldn't even send it out of your Gmail account. It went through our own servers. And, uh, it, and then it would track if the other person viewed it or clicked on the link. And it would help you send those emails out really quickly. And that, like, you know, it's unfair to say that I built a business and got it to revenue within three days. It's, it was a year of learning with brain trust that I was like, nope, got to charge money for it. Nope, won't add any features that it doesn't need. And nope, I'm just going to market it instead of just trying to like get people to sign up. That like just made it go boom within three days and start generating revenues more than brain trusted in, in nearly a year. Wow. So you did that in a really short period of time. Um, a lot of founders, I know founders that are 500K deep and they still haven't got a sale right? So you did the absolute opposite of that. And I understand that you're also a big believer in the idea of don't do freemium from day one, right? Charge. Um, I, I think I understand why you do it, but you know, could, could you share it with us? Because I think it's absolutely genius. It's basically going to speed up validation and uh, reduce some bias, won't it? Yeah. Ultimately, people lie. And it's not because they're lying to you because they're dishonest, which I know sounds counterintuitive. It's because they want to be nice and they don't really know. And so traditional startup advice is go do customer discovery, go build a product that people really want. The truth is, unless you sell them on a product and they buy and swipe the credit card, you will never really know if you're creating something of value. And so I'm not a believer in freemium. I believe that you should have a trial product and you should charge for money. And you should charge a significant amount of money because with the cost of getting attention these days for your product, you need to be able to be charging a sufficient amount to be able to grow. Otherwise, you're not building a real business. Right. Uh, and so I always coach my founders on two things. One, build an audience first. Out of that audience, figure out what they really want, then build a product and charge for it. And that's how we coach our founders to go build SaaS businesses. Yeah. So I have a lot of people that are asking me and, and they want, they want me to ask you TK, you know, how to do validation, how to go about getting feedback, how to balance, you know, primary validation of, you know, me talking to a user with actual, you know, data and let's, let's call it macro trends, kind of seeing what's going on in the market, you know, and then there's the actual, just build the product, ship the MVP to some customer and get them to use it. And see if it sticks. How do you balance these things out? Yeah, I the the thing that there's two things that come to mind for this. The first thing is I remember when uh, I was 500 startups batch one, and uh, so that's how early we were in this whole game, right? We were batch number one, 500 startups. It was the first day I was meeting some of the other founders, and I met these two guys. And these two guys, you know, we're you know we're like introducing each other and like, hey, what are you guys working on? And they're like, oh, like we want to revolutionize the winning industry, and so I was like, oh, cool. Like, are you guys married? They're like, nope. Uh, it's like, have you been in the wedding industry? They're like, nope. But they had like, like, you know, done the research and did the customer discovery. So they were convinced they were going to revolutionize the wedding industry. And my rule for founders as I coach them is don't be the two guys that have never gotten married or never been in the wedding industry that you want to go revolutionize the wedding industry. And, you know, it sounds kind of funny, but it's also true. Like figure out a problem space where you have domain knowledge. Um, you cannot just analyze your way out of that, at least not in B2B SaaS, which is what I specialize in. Right. Uh, figure out where you have a whole lot of hours on and find the spreadsheets that, are, that were in your job that, that could be converted into amazing software companies. Those are the things that you want to focus on. Um, that's the first thing. And I think the second thing is you really want to figure out if it's an important and urgent problem. A lot of people solve problems and people are like, yeah, it's a, it's a problem. If someone did this, it would be really cool, but it's not important nor urgent. And unless it's an important and urgent problem, people are, it's never going to be a software business. 
Yeah, and that's more so the issue now than ever before, right? If you're selling painkillers, you're doing well. If you're selling vitamin, uh, vitamins or vitamin waters, it's a little bit more tricky, right? Do you think yeah. uh, do, do you do you think right now we're in a pandemic? Is it you know is it always more important to focus on needs than wants, or is it like specifically understand understand the economy, understand the market? It's more important now than ever. I I would argue that it's always been important. Uh, yeah. and I think it's it, during frothy times, it's easier to get away with not doing those things, which is why, and I did a video recently where we were talking about these 12 companies that, uh, uh, started in, in the last recession and they ended up becoming, uh, either IPOing or being acquired for multiple billions of dollars. And the question was like, why? Like, what, what is with like 2008, 2009, arguably the last time things were so bad that these companies thrived? It was because they were forced to focus on essentials. And I think that uh, that's always the general rule in business. Uh, but during frothy times, it's easier to get away with less. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes total sense. And And you talk about how startups really need to have different playbooks depending on when this is in 2020, right? So if you're, you know, right now it's your, your marketing message, what you're doing today is fundamentally different than what you were just doing a few months ago. So I guess it's, it's about being really, really agile too, which that really struck me because any product could look like it's, uh, it's a painkiller if you position it the right way, right? You need to, I guess, communicate it in your product and your marketing message why is this a painkiller and not a vitamin right yeah. is it do you think it's messaging or do you think it's inherent to the product or is it both no i, I think it's the positioning uh, 100% right like even with tout app yes it took off right like it started generating revenues but then i actually ignored it for 6 months cuz i was just like how big can this possibly get like it's email templates and tracking like this is not you can't like can you even build a business around this mm. right um, and then six months later, I, I was talking to my prior co-founder. I did tout up as a solo founder, but the prior company before that, the one we sold in college, my co-founder, one of my co-founders, Pete Curley, I was chatting with him and he was like, look, dude, on one hand, you're trying to replace email and no one cares. On the other hand, you made email work a little bit better with tout app and people love it. And there's gotta be a group of people that would love it like a lot. And so the first year of tout app, we were kind of like, it's anyone that uses email that hates copying and pasting. That was our messaging. And we did okay. Then year two, we said, Oh, the, the customers that paid the most complained the least and the, were the most fun to work with were salespeople. And for salespeople, it was directly try and tied to their compensation plan that the more leads they generated, the more deals they closed and the more money they made. And we took the exact same product and positioned it away from templates, tracking analytics to salespeople generating pipeline. And it took some time to do that. There were some fits and starts to really figure that out. And boom, it went crazy. So a lot of times it's really not the technology, it's the sales and marketing and positioning and the narrative that, that founders need to work on. Do you have any advice to help founders figure out what that is sooner? If you're trying, you know, the faster you can figure out the positioning, but also the ideal customer persona, I guess ideally that's what happened. You figured out your ideal customer persona was selling it to salespeople. How long did it take you to figure that out? And if you were to do that again, is there a framework to get to that sooner? Yeah, I have this one principle and like, you know, we're in a crazy time right now. A lot of things that happen in the world, you don't quite understand. It's hard to explain. Uh, but I have this rule and this applies very much. So in this phase of building product and finding the right market, look at the comp plan of your users, like the, the, uh, the target user you're, you're going after, look at their comp plan. If you can show how by using your product, they make more money, they're compensated more, they will 100% buy it. Um, if it's not aligned to their comp plan, then uh, it's gotta save them some time. And even then, it's a hard sell. Productivity is a hard sell. But if you can show like, hey, you make more money if you buy the software, uh, or you save money, 
or you avert risk so that you are insured to make money in your comp plan, then you win. Um, there's some tricks to this that angel investors are taught. Is there a line item already existing for your category of software, right? Like that's mm -hmm. how you know there's clearly baked into the comp plan. Uh, they're like, in order for us to hit our number as a company, we need these things. These are the expenses. This is an improved expense. That's how you know it's a thing. Um, now that's usually red ocean. That's like a lot of competition you're going into. Right. If you go after blue ocean, think about the comp plan of the people you're going after. Who has the comp plan that incentivizes them? They will make more money if they use your product. Bingo. Your first earliest days, let's go hyper-focused on those. So you had tout app, you banged it out essentially over a weekend, right? Who did, who did you actually... Like what were your first actual steps to find customers? How did you know who to send an email out to? Was it friends and family? Did you find a list on the web? Or how did you make that first outreach? Because what I'm seeing a lot of founders have is they have an idea or an MVP or they actually have a product, but there's that resistance to figuring out the song and the dance of the first reach outs. How did you do that, TK? Yeah, um, Tout App went so quick because of two things. One, I had a lot of time already invested into things for brain trust. Um, I already had an audience. I had, I had founders, I had uh, biz dev, I had salespeople reading my blog. Uh, I already had a hit uh, page one for Hacker News multiple times because I was sharing my journey in building a, a, a business. Um, Before you started Tout Up before I started out. So I already had an audience. So the first thing that I did was I wrote a blog post about how I created a SaaS product over the course of a weekend. And literally I laid out, here's the services I use, here's the things I use, here's the product, go sign up. And I posted that and my audience got it. It hit number one in Hacker News and that got a whole bunch of signups going. So, you know, people talk about overnight successes. They don't talk about the, the, you know, that's like the top of the iceberg, not the underneath the water thing. Like there was a year and a half of me banging my head on trying to get brain trust to work. Um, and, and it's just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't find the click, but then I just like moved a bunch of stuff, copied a bunch of stuff. Cause you know, SaaS businesses have similar plumbing and boom, it just took off because I was able to leverage the things I had already put effort into. And the biggest thing was audience. I built an audience of people that I knew I wanted to serve. And I sent them like, Hey, I built building a company. This like I was, and literally the blog post was like, I'm having trouble generating users for brain trust. And everyone knew brain trust. I've been sharing that journey. So I built this thing so I can email people so I can get more people to sign up, go check it out. So that was the first one. The second thing was I used tout to go reach out to uh, what I knew. Uh, the question I asked was, okay, the group of people that I think will really get value from this are salespeople our biz dev people, our PR people, and HR people. They're outward facing, right? So I was like, where do these people hang out? And so I actually didn't email the individual salespeople using Tout. I emailed community leaders around those demographics. And the one that worked magically was uh, I cold emailed um, Jason Freed and DHH of 37 Signals. And I said, hey, and at that time, they were operating high rise. High rise was their CRM. Right. And so, part of that weekend, I integrated it where every single time it sent an email, it would log it in high rise automatically. And from high rise, you could like add someone into tout, like with the click of a button. Sweet. And so, I emailed them, like, hey, you have a CRM, but it doesn't let you email people and doesn't let you log into high rise. That's what our product does. We'd love it if you let people know. And they, they featured it on day two. To their like, I don't know how, like there were probably 200,000 people or something. 200,000 newsletter, I'm like, hey, if you use high rise and you send emails, which is like everyone that uses high rise, set up tout. Um, and, and, uh, and the other thing that was funny was, this is a side story, but like it just reminded me, tout was not even called tout. Uh, tout was called pitch, because you know, you pitch people with email. Um, and literally on day two, we were page number one on Hacker News, featured on the 37 Singles newsletter. Not because like I got lucky because I had been working on those relationships for like over a year and building yeah. that audience. But also we got a cease and desist letter. We got a cease and desist letter saying, Hey, we have pitched trademarked. You can't use it. Um, and I'm like, what? Like, 
And I was literally like, I don't even care about this. I care about brain trust. I built this for myself and screw you guys. So I literally went on thesaurus.com and I typed in pitch and I had thesaurus.com and I had dotster, which is my domain thing. And I was like, all right. And I just went down the list of words to see what, what domain that's a synonym of pitch plus app was available and toutapp.com was available. So I registered and just moved it over. I'm like, okay, oh, it's called tout now. I have to re-record the <laughs> demo video. But the, you know, and that was like day three. Wow. So that happened really, really fast, but it's all that, it's all that stuff that happened behind the scenes, right? Cause brain trust was essentially its own startup, right? You were trying to, you were trying to build this, you know, as a business and I guess you can look at it and an ignorant person might say, Oh yeah, you failed. Yeah. But like it's everything that you did there from and building an audience and even, even from a product perspective, from a code perspective, right? You took that, you shipped it over, it allowed you to build your audience. I'm hearing that story come up over and over again now where people get an email list from a failed startup that use that list to power their Kickstarter campaign or yep. they build a product, they find no way to monetize it, but they have a whole bunch of business addresses and then they upsell them to something else and lo and behold, another startup. So that yeah. seems like a really good way to do it. Just get out and do something, build an audience, try to monetize it. If you can't monetize it with the idea you're doing today, you'll monetize it with the idea you got tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And brain trust failed, it did. Uh, the, I think the thing you gotta understand as a startup founder is that ideas fail, products fail, businesses fail. But as long as you keep finding a way forward, you will never fail. You will only learn and get better, right? There's some saying about how uh, successful people are people that l actually learn from failure. Right? Yeah. Like, and it, it's a thing. It's true. Yeah, it's not easy to do, though. Um, so you didn't experience a lot of failure in your first few days of Tout App. That went extremely well because of everything you did beforehand. So you got the feeling of product market fit pretty quickly, right? Um, I want to I wanna know if you didn't get that kind of reaction, is that a signal? Like if you send out a whole bunch of emails, if you do a whole bunch of hustle and you don't get anything back, like how do you interpret signals as an entrepreneur in these early days? Because, you know, we understand what product market fit might feel like. I know it's kind of a, a gray area definition but we know it's definitely different than the logging tons of hours, sending a lot of messages. Nobody's going to your website. Nobody's signing up. Like when do you know when you need to keep going and when do you know when it's time to reassess? Yeah. Um, I think you gotta be ruthless about cutting ideas off. Um, I think that, um, this may be controversial, but I actually think startups are supposed to be easy. Um, um, and, and what I mean by that is building a business is hard and there's a lot of growth. There's a lot of mindset things you have to go through. There's a lot of hard work there, but that core kernel of the idea when it's right, it's supposed to be easy. It's never supposed to be an uphill battle to convince people to go adopt that idea. Um, if it is, then you're either talking to the wrong people, uh, their comp plans aren't aligned, or you're not communicating it the right way, or the idea actually sucks and you should just ruthlessly move on. Right. And so when you give up, I would argue that it's when you've sufficiently exhausted those three scenarios. Are you talking to the right people? Is the ICP right? Is the messaging right? Are you communicating it, is it in the way where it's aligned to their comp plan? And then is the idea actually like effective? Is it easier to use? Is it fast? Does it get you a result? Does it get you to an aha moment? And you got to get all three. And, and when you know you exhausted those three, that's when you know you need to move on. Um, that's tricky, right? It's like, how do you know you've exhausted all the ICPs that could be valid? And there's a certain amount of luck involved in that. Um, but I think that if... I think that a lot of us lie to ourselves on, oh, it's supposed to be hard, so let me just keep grinding, and I'm supposed to be grinding, and then it'll finally work. It's like, no, dude, that's the definition of insanity. Yeah, yeah, this is why I also like the idea that you push forward as a SaaS leader to not go freemium first, because 
it's kind of like you're lying to yourself if you're just scared to get that harsh rejection. If you're scared for somebody to say no, if people don't want to spend $30 a month on your product, like maybe that's a sign, right? So instead, a lot of founders, including myself in the past, you take the easy way around. You say, oh, we're new. They just don't trust us yet. But it's like find a way to position the value in a way that a handful of people will just sign up. And as you're saying, if I get it, it's like there's enough difficult things about building a company, but having something that's important to a certain group of people should be something that you figure out pretty fast. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's right. The, the other thing I'll say is that I think that there are two, I, two broad cate- categories of startup ideas, right? One is where you're trying to change how the world behaves. And the mm-hmm. other is you're very honest about how the world behaves and you give them a fast way to do it. Um, a lot of startup founders, right? And, and uh, believe me, I'm guilty of this. I try to kill email, <laughs> right? And, and uh, you learn, you don't bet against email. Like I, I have startup founders that pitch me on like, well, email sucks. I'm like, nope, see you later. Like I, I'm invested in superhuman. I'm like, <laughs> like, I'm long email. Don't bet against email. Um, and my point is that um, don't try to be altruistic. Like you want to go change the world. You want to make the world a better place. Build a really successful business. Take the money and create comp plans that allow you to change the world. But don't try to do that through a product. Like that, you're just up for a long slog especially your first, second, or third startup, right? You're already dealing, you're you're already fighting the force of gravity enough, right? Make a whole bunch of money, um, have something valuable for a certain group of people, and then do something afterwards, right? It seems like a company is a cool chance to, um, you know, to provide some kind of thought leadership too, right? The bigger the company, the cooler the company, the more people listen. Like Mark Benioff is like the best example of that, right? You used to always go to his events every year. And I'd love you to, to share this story about, uh, about Mark's presentations. It was it called DreamHack? Uh, Dreamforce. Dreamforce, right. Yeah. So yeah, huge, huge thought leader in the industry. I love him as an example of somebody who's, you know, who uses his position as a way to make the world a better place. But, um, you know, I, I also know that you've shared a good story recently about, um, you know, about he, how he always seems to be right on the things that he says and the world seems to follow whatever he says at Dreamforce. Force. Hey, can you elaborate that a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, we were talking about macro trends and one of the things we train founders to do is like, what are the macro trends going on in your space? Like that puts wind behind your back. And with us, with Dreamforce, every year, Mark does his keynote. Mark's brilliant. Uh, he's the true godfather of SaaS, in my opinion. Um, and um, it's always so like, is it Mark or is it Jason Lemkin? I think they're both godfathers in their own rights. I respect them both immensely Agreed. Um, when it comes to SaaS. But, you know, Mark Benioff is like the one that like truly built a SaaS empire. And he does his Dreamforce keynote, which kind of set the agenda for our space for the next year. And at first it was always like, oh my God, what is he going to talk about? Like, what's the agenda going to be? But then you, like, I realized I'm like, he wasn't setting the agenda. He was looking at what is the most searched for trend. And he figured out how to orient his company behind that trend so they could ride that way every year. And so when social enterprise was the big rage, he got behind social enterprise. When um, small businesses and helping people and self-education was a big rage, he started focusing on self-education. So he has a giant group of people that are proficient in his platform. So I think that's uh, when AI was a thing or the fifth industrial resolution, uh, re- revolution, he didn't invent that, but he identified that was the trend he got behind it. And I think that's what great startup founders really need to do effectively. And there's this one concept of earning the right, right? When you're starting off, what you need to be doing is aligning to the existing world um, as, and, and figure out how to wedge in. Once you're wedged in, then you earn the right to make change. A lot of founders, and I've been guilty of this myself, we, we try to make the change right from the beginning and everyone's like, look, I, I, I don't want to. It's too hard, I don't get paid, whatever. But if you kind of wedge in, then you can earn the right and because you've earned their trust to say, hey, this is working well for you. This is clearly getting you, fed. can you try this one other thing? And I bet it'll make you more money. It's slightly different, but if you do it, you'll actually do well. 
then they trust you to do. You earn the right to go after these bigger things, which comes at a second or third stage. Yeah. So you want to align yourself with the macro trends. Maybe it sounds like an obvious question, but do you have any advice for how to know the market trends? Are we just talking Google searching, find the right publications in your industry, find whatever the, the key piece of research data that's coming out every year and align to that? Should it be, if I'm doing something that is related to SaaS, should I just look at what Mark is saying and follow that? Or what's the most efficient way to check in on macro trends? Yeah, I, I would say there's a number of ways. We go into detail on that inside our program. At a high level, you know, you look at trendsetters. There's always trendsetters like Mark. Uh, you also look at the data. Uh, search engine data is a great way. Um, but you also just go and look at what is top of mind for um, the, your core customers. Like what are they, like go talk to your best customers and understand what are the challenges that they're facing. Yeah. Bang on. So you got your initial traction with Tout App. You started to take off. You started to J curve for, for, I want to use a cool word. I use J curve whenever I can. Um, you started the J curve. Life was good from that perspective. You had product market fit. What did, feed lo what did feedback loops look like for you? You had something that obviously wasn't perfect because you built it in a couple of days. And as smart as you are, I think more code could have gone into that. How did you adjust that over time? Uh, did you, like, were you, were, were you the one that was talking directly with the market? Did you have somebody on your team that was reaching out? Or how did your feedback loop look? Um, it was pretty wide. So we had an email support line. So I got a lot of feedback from there. Um, we had, back then, there was a website called Get Satisfaction. Uh, I don't know if you remember, like it created a support community for every product. You can go in and submit requests. So we had a little thing over there for feature requests. The number one feature request was, can we please bold a word in our emails? Cause it was only text only emails. I'm like, yep, got it. Um, I remember one time I had a WeWork office and somehow our WeWork building manager, we were in the first WeWork building and uh, Adam Newman, who was the founder of WeWork, got me my first angel investor. And cool. the, in that first WeWork building, the first ever WeWork building manager was using Tout to send out uh, notifications to mem members of the building. And I, I, his trial ran out. And I, like all of a sudden in my office, I see he shows up to my office and he's like knocking on my door frantically. And I'm like, am I in trouble? Like, what is, like, did I forget to play rent? Like, I, I don't know what's going on. So I open the door. He's like, TK here's some money. I'm like, what are you talking? He was like, here's some money. My corporate card isn't working. My trial is over. I need to use tout. I can't do my job if I can't use tout. And I'm like, oh, uh, he's like literally giving me $30 or $30 a month. He's giving me $30 in cash. He's, it's like, this is all I have. Like, just take this. And so and I, I think that was one of the moments where I'm like, I think we have something. If this dude is hunting me down and giving me crumpled bill, it was like, disgusting. <laughs> like, okay, uh, cool. <laughs> so we got feedback from all over. Um, people found you. People found us, right? Yeah. Like they, they hunted you down. And um, I think that's also the sign of a good idea when people are seeking you out and they're like, hey, because I was ignoring it. I was like, I don't think this is going to be big enough. Like email templates and tracking is not a big enough business. I, I, I don't want to focus on this. I'm going to go focus on brain trust. It's going to replace email and it's going to be a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah. So when your feedback loop is easier, that's a sign of product market fit. When customers are willing to, to start paying pretty quickly, um, that's also a sign of product market fit, right? So I guess if you don't get these experiences, you should consider doing something different, right? Whether it's, I would, I guess, start with messaging if you're not getting that, right? You don't just give up, but maybe try some different messaging. I've always believed in being like really, really find a few customers and then ask them how to find other customers. I don't know if you've had some experiences like that, but yeah, you ask a customer referrals like- are a big, Referrals are a big sign. We had a lot of people that were like, hey, you got to try a tout. And so they would send them our way. And that also is very powerful also. Yeah, completely.
So you guys started uh, started growing, uh, growing bigger, faster, stronger. Um, you got into an interesting situation though when you when you really started growing. You had a team, I think, of around eighty people. I don't know how many years later you started in twenty eleven, right? Yep. Yeah, so, so it was 2015, 2016, 2016, really. Uh, 2016, that's the year where three things happened. Uh, it was uh, like, a, like a year after Andreessen Horowitz invested in us, it's number one. So all the other VCs were like, oh my God, what is our bet in this space? Almost overnight, we had three more competitors crop up. The second thing that happened was we needed to go raise our next round, but the SaaS multiples dropped early 2016. So I don't know, like Tableau and LinkedIn both took a nosedive. Uh, and so our valuation multiples were all crazy and SaaS funding almost froze. Uh, and the third thing that happened was our board member from Andreessen Horowitz was retiring. He was like, hey, I need to retire. And, uh, and so we were like, oh. And so it was, all, it was a trifecta. And so we were at 80 people. Uh, we invested heavily into burn to grow, grow faster. And the increased competition made it where it was harder to grow faster because there was so much noise in the market. Um, and so what we had to do was uh, figure, we essentially, what we did was, and that's, that's actually where the true J curve came in, right? J curve is always where you're high and then low, and then you go back up again, right? Um, and so uh, what we ended up having to do was take the team from 80 people to 40 people and we had to essentially apply a private equity playbook to turn a VC company to more of uh, uh, like a private equity well-run company, which is very different. Um, and uh, we ended up, quad through the transformation, we ended up quadrupling our deal sizes, shortening our sales cycles, going up market, and having two of the largest quarters in company history after going through that trend. So we were doing more with less people, ironically. Um, and so that was one of those things where we hit a bunch of tailwinds and the category got just too hot and we had to make tough, tough change. It was some, one of the toughest years of my life, uh, to get the business from a hyperscale business that wasn't sustaining to a business that was ca close to cash flow break even. Yeah. And you're, I understand your investors wanted you to cut more, right? They didn't want you to just go from 80 to 40. They wanted you to go from what, 80 to 15 people. So it seems yeah. like you rebelliously fought back. <laughs> yeah. They were like, look, just cut to 15 and figure it out. I'm like, look, uh, at our current customer base, like we cannot support the business at 15 people. And, uh, you know, th those, there were moments there where like, I wish I had a boss that would just fire me. Cause then I would just go back. Like I would just like <laughs> crawl into bed and cry, you know, like, but for me, I was like, well, I have employees, I have investors beyond the board. Um, I had entire sales teams that come in in the morning and rely on our software to be able to do their jobs and get paid. Um, and so being able to cut, Cut and just 215 was just not an option. So it was like, look, there's no way we're doing that. Um, and I don't like, they weren't going to fire me because it's like, who else is going to take care of this mess? Uh, so I'm like, look, here's what we're going to do. And we ended up doing two layoffs. Um, and, and, uh, that hurt a lot, but there's always this thing of when you're trying to fix a business, you want to get rid of fat and not muscle and not bone. Right. Uh, and so you had to be very careful about leaning up, but not cutting yourself like, off like severing a limb uh, doing it yeah and i was going to ask you by the way um what was it like getting investment dollars from andreessen horowitz it's uh, it seems like this mystical kind of great thing um i i'd love to hear the you know if you can share the the so, some of the benefits or what just what that experience was like um and i'd also like to hear if there was any drawbacks because you just alluded to the idea that once they gave you money, it was like a smoke signal to the rest of the world that like, this is a hot market. So do you want to start with the experience side? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'll start with the, any potential drawbacks. There weren't any from a investor point of view. If you have yeah. one of the best VC venture capital firms backing you, that's net, net positive. Um, and I think that if it wasn't the large VC firm sending a signal that this is a hot space, 
it would have been something else like our success or our noise or there's, there's always it would have happened. Yeah. The, the real lesson to learn from that is the saying that I learned much later in life. It's that pioneers have arrows on their back. Um, and so if you're first to market, and I didn't know this, this is something I learned the hard way that I coach founders on now. Uh, in fact, there's a parts of that journey that, that those two years, I learned more about truly building and scaling a SaaS business than some of my other years. Uh, I think you learn a lot more when things are going wrong and you have to go fix it than when things are going great and you're on a rocket ship and no one really knows who's the one that contributed to the success. Um, right. And so I learned that pioneers have arrows on their back, right? And so if you're the first to market, you will have arrows on your back because you're figuring out a lot of stuff and then others will fast follow. And that's a lesson that I kind of wish I learned before, but you know, you learn things the hard way in terms of, uh, so that's like, you know, just in terms of were there any drawbacks and they're truly yeah. honestly weren't because, um, being in a room with Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz and Steve Sanofsky and like some of these legends is a, one of the coolest fucking things ever. Yeah. B, one of the most humbling things ever. C is just one of the most educational things ever. So like, and there's nothing in the world I would trade for that. And, and uh, the, there was this moment where I realized this, uh, it was our partner pitch meeting. So, you know, I had already met with our main partner and then we were brought in for the partner pitch meeting and uh, the partner pitch meeting went for an hour and for the first 30 minutes, Ben, Mark, anyone else in the room asked me questions. They just peppered me with questions. And by that time, you know, I had probably spent a hundred thousand hours thinking about the business and where we're going. So conceptually, you just like, you have processed this. Ben and Mark, they come in and for 30 minutes, they pepper you with incredibly smart questions where you're like, oh, I can't believe you asked me that question. And there was this one moment, I'll never forget this. Like I, I forget, it was, uh, I, will, I do forget it was Ben or Mark. One of them was like, okay, got it. And after that, okay, got it. It was like that moment where they had computed in their mind a model of this entire business and space and problem and solution and strategies that we were thinking about. Yeah. And then they went on to ask a set of questions to stress test me and that I was like, I have spent a hundred thousand hours on this and I'm barely scratching the surface on these questions and answers. And you just computed that and now know to ask me that question. Whereas there should be another year, a board meeting away before you ask me that. That's how smart they are. And I think that was one of the most amazing experiences in my life where you're like, Oh, that's why they're so good. Like they were able to compute through a series of the right questions to get the fundamentals right. So they could have a level of discussion with me at a strategic level. That was so powerful. Um, that, that was the true privilege, I think of working with people like that. And, and there's one more thing I'll say, um, uh, you know, obviously in recent Horowitz is, is a famed investment firm and they have, and rightfully so. Equally impressive to me was our Series A investor, uh, Jackson Square Ventures. Greg Gretsch was on our board. Equally in, uh, uh, amazing to me was Founder Collective, who was part of our seed round. Uh, David Frankel was the partner. And these guys could go toe to toe with these other guys. They were just as smart and valuable. Um, and the one thing I'll tell founders is, yes, brand name is important and powerful, but do not discount others because they don't have as big of a brand because there are some incredibly smart people who are who purposefully stay under the radar and deliver incredible value i would imagine that andreessen horowitz gets a pretty good value on their deals because of the clout they have too right i would just imagine that you get a little bit extra perhaps when you go with them so that the term sheet might be a little bit more aggressive. That would just be my assumption. I think it varies on deal to deal and how competitive it is. Um, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, they a, have enough competitors. Yeah, you're totally right. That's a, that's a heck of an experience. You, you, you can just tell how smart Ben and Mark are just by, well, you can tell how smart Mark is just by looking at him. You got that big, beautiful egg shaped head. You know exactly how much brain power is, uh, is stored in there. So 
that that's a pretty cool experience that that you had and you know and one that I, I would wish any founder on it seems like um in entrepreneurship the more things that you see the smarter you get like it just it seems like every single SaaS company that you're coaching it makes you a little bit smarter every single deal that goes into Mark and Ben's room it makes Mark and Ben a little bit faster because you're probably hearing a lot of SaaS founders that come into your school your coaching programs your summits and they tell you what they're doing and you probably go got it pretty quickly too right uh, partly you know what one of the things that you know this is one of those things you just don't plan for but it somehow happened I, i've worked at the best hedge fund in the world uh so that's ray dalio uh i've worked with one of the best venture capital firms in the world that's ben and mark and i've also worked with um one of the best private equity firms in the world that's vista uh, so i've had the trifecta and if there's one thing they have in common is their their love for core principles. Um, and so I would argue it's not enough to get exposure to multiple companies. It's important to get that exposure and then extract that out into core principles and patterns that you can then use for better decision making and better problem solving later on. One without the other doesn't quite work. And I think it's because I've been privilege to work in these organizations with leaders that value first principles so much it has allowed me to actually uh really focus in on first principles and think about well what is the pattern what is the thing to be learned uh from the tout app experience the brain trust experience the recommend experience the hip cal experience the plaxo experience and everything else and every other founder that i work with what was it like being in the same room as ray dalio <laughs> It's, it's like, it's the same giddy, childlike, amazed feeling as being in the same room as Ben and Mark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, they're amazing humans and you're just like, and you get to ask them questions. And I, I'm there, I, there was this one question I asked Ray Dalio. I, I was like, Ray, like you built Bridgewater. And this is when I was clearly thinking about starting my own company again. So you built Bridgewater. Like, would you go start another thing? Like Bridgewater is an institution now. And he gave me one of the most honest <laughs> answers. He was like, oh God, like he was like a visceral reaction. I was like, no, no, it's so hard to start. Like, do you know how hard it is? Like no, like no one even knows who, who, where to get the printer and how to get the laptop working. You gotta go buy it yourself. And you don't even know how to like get an employee going. And right now I'm like onboarding employees. Like this is easy. I'm just told, I never want to go through that again. It's like such an honest answer. It's, he's right. It's like, yeah, God, that is really fucking hard. Just go from zero to something. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, I don't know how we got on that, but yeah, like, um, incredible, <laughs> I would say. Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to get onto it anyway. So, um, you, you as a person through all these experiences, you've evolved, right? Like I, I, I I'm going to pull up a, a screenshot here in a moment and you let me know, you, you let me know when this was and, and, and what you were thinking at the time. All right. I can't even imagine what screenshot you're going to bring up. <laughs> it's a little bit pixelated. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. We got, um, we got this one here and, uh, and we got this one here. <laughs> this was, so this was hip Cal, uh, AKA our boy brand boy band, uh, at our fraternity house. So this was hip Cal. Uh, these were my co-founders. So that's Garrett, Pete, Glenn, Chris, and me. And Pete was the one I was telling you the story when he was like, dude, I don't understand brain trust, but tout is awesome. Go do tout. Uh, and we're all really good friends even till today. Um, we had just sold hip Cal, the company we started. Um, and Plaxo bought it and uh, Plaxo was a West coast company. They were a SaaS business. It was Sean Parker's company before Facebook. And, uh, I never met Sean Parker, but he was gone by then. Um, and what they wanted, Plaxo wanted to make a big deal about it, acquiring us. So they sent a photographer to come to our fraternity house and take photos. And, uh, and this was on the, on the porch and the other one, the one before was completely posed. I don't know, like the, the dude found some corner in some rusty part of the fraternity house that no one goes to. And I'm just like this and I'm like, okay. And like, like who opens the lap? Like that is not my workstation. But we took a photo because we were <laughs> announcing the deal and everything. Um, how, how old were you here? Uh, so I was, it was my senior year of college. So however old, like, I don't know, 21? 
Okay, I give you at most 14. <laughs> <laughs> well, how old do you think I am right now? Like, I look 12 right now. I mean, yeah, that, that's true. That's true. Yeah, you, uh, you, you've been aging very youthfully. Yeah, I'll, ta I'll take it. Yeah, I mean, like, I look at, so I look at that person. You, you're talking about evolution. I look at that person. Like, he looks like a, a different human to me. Like, I almost don't recognize him because uh, I think well, that's one of the things about building a SaaS business uh, or like just being a startup founder, like not just SaaS, but you are, you are on an accelerant to grow as a human as fast as possible because your business grows as fast as possible. And sometimes you can keep up and sometimes you can and you do your best. Uh, but it's like, it's, I mean, all of us are. So Pete and Garrett uh, and Chris, those three guys, um, when I was starting Tout App, they were starting their next company and they were like, TK, you want to come join? I'm like, no, dude, like, I, I'm a big believer in email. I want to work on email. So I did yeah. Tout App and they actually started HipChat, uh, which was the precursor of Slack. Um, and so they did HipChat. And now they're on to their next company and I'm on to my next company. So we've stayed in touch and it was, it was an incredible, thank you for, sh thank you for showing me that. It's like a nice reminder. It's really cool. Well, it, it, a lot, a lot of things have happened between these pictures, um, you know, and, uh, and, and one, one of the things that have happened, um, you're a lot more confident and less shy. I would imagine just stereotyping, just looking at the picture, knowing that yeah. you're a computer science grad, you know, just seeing how you're not at the, if I was in that picture, I'd be like the closest one to the camera, you know, <laughs> but like you're kind of hanging out in the back, you know, a little bit more conservative. I would imagine your experiences have allowed you to step up in all ways and, and forms. Right. And you've kind of put yourself out there and challenged yourself. Um, am I accurate there? Yeah. Um, I think one, you, you have to develop self-confidence right if you don't believe then like if you think it is then it is if you don't it you don't it's not right and so as a star founder uh like 50 percent is mindset and i learned that and i had to I, I and i wanted to i wanted to i'm like no i want to be the founder uh and i wanted to be uh the leader for the company because that's what was needed to uh, accomplish our goals I was always the reluctant CEO. Like I don't, I never wanted to be CEO, mm. but I was kind of like, well, if, it, if it's needed and, and I actually truly believe people that crave being CEO make terrible CEOs. Uh, people that are like, fine, I'll do it. But like, all I, what I really care about is the, you know, the results, they make better CEOs. I learned uh, just from my experience. And, and so, um, yeah, I went through a lot of like, look also in the journey I went through ups and downs, right? Like, you, we talked about 2015, 2016, were like tough years. Yeah. Uh, but those are the kind of years where uh, you really get the scar. You really learn. That's when you really learn. A lot of the advice that I give founders and I coach uh, founders on, especially with growth, I learned during those years. because I knew how to make business really work. Um, even Marketo years were really tough years because I was the youngest senior vice president and it was such a crazy transformation. We, were, we did a two year transformation and uh, sold the company. And like, I, I spent three months running Europe. I spent three months running uh, Australia, NZ. Uh, I was doing m and I was working on corporate strategy. Um, you had to grow and scale really fast in a really tough environment. And those things um, change you and those things push you and you start to realize uh, what you're capable of. And so am I more confident now? Maybe. Do I still second guess myself? Yeah. I'm human. Do I still get scared? Yeah. Do I still wonder if we're going to achieve our goals? Sometimes. But I think that um, the one thing I learned is like, look, if you just like stick with it, you have belief and you dis have discipline and you stick with it, um, you can accomplish things. And when you do that, the, the, that creates the scar tissue in you that makes you stronger, makes you more motivated, makes you more certain about what you're doing. And I think that's the right way to go about getting it. I would agree, TK. Yeah. Um, you know, you talk, talk about uh, sometimes you second guess yourself. When I'm watching you on YouTube, that's not what I think. When I'm watching you on YouTube, you are pounding your fists. The whole table, I don't want to do it because things are going to disconnect, but you're <laughs> pounding your fists 
and, uh, and, and so enthusiastic. It's really entertaining just to watch your YouTube channel. So, um, you know, I'll give you a chance to give some plugs and, but I want to give you a plug along the way, man, because your content's really good. Um, and you deliver it in a way that honestly, it's, it's like my daily cappuccino. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and, you know, I appreciate that a lot. Um, it's, uh, the reason those videos are so certain and with so much energy is a, I'm genuinely passionate about building SaaS businesses and B I'm only talking about things that I've done. Right. Yeah. And so my YouTube channel is like, I've literally done this and here's what you need to know. I've distilled it down. Uh, and I feel less uncertainty about those things. The things I feel uncertain about are the new growth areas that I'm going into. Right. Um, like I know SaaS businesses, but now I'm in more of an info business and I'm more in a coaching business. And those are things where I'm like, literally I have three coaches that teach me how to do these things and how to navigate this. Uh, I'm learning how to give the right, perfect presentation and I'm honing in my craft there. I'm learning how to speak on stage better so that we're selling something that's not a software, but more of a, an outcome and a result. So all those things are new areas for growth for me where I feel uncertain. And I think it's important to acknowledge uncertainty. Uh, and I think it's important to seek out frameworks and coaches that can help you navigate that uncertainty. Um, yeah. and, that, that, and I think that like, that's probably like, to be clear, that's important advice for founders, uh, going from zero to 10. Um, one, one thing that I realized that may be worth mentioning is originally I was really opposed to coaches. Uh, and, um, because I was like, like, if this person is so good, then why aren't they doing it? Right. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it's like, and so, and then I, eventually I learned the difference between a coach and a mentor and a consultant and you need all three and mm -hmm. none of them have to have the same goals as you, but they need to be able to be able to light the path ahead for you. And they do it in different ways, whether it's a coach or a mentor or, uh, and what I learned was coaches are there to give you frameworks. Consultants are there to do the work for you. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And mentors are literally people who you want to become. And they, they are there to help show you like what, what their experience was. And I find myself kind of playing the role of mentor slash coach in, in unstoppable right now. That's, that's very cool. I appreciate you breaking that out because I think a lot of people just throw all those words in the same category. Maybe some coaches and mentors, uh, you know, confuse it amongst themselves, but it's good to understand that they each sort of have their role and, uh, and you come at it from that perspective. When you, uh, when, when you like through this learning experience, TK, like the, the thing that's cool is, and I know we talked a little bit about kind of all the stages, but we focused more on the early days of tout app. Um, and then we talk, so what you needed to do, what you needed to learn to execute when you're running tout app versus what you needed to learn and execute when you were at Marketo. I still can't say it. Mar Marketo. Okay. I'll say it. <laughs> say, it with crazy say it like that all the time. I wish, I wish I said that like that all the time. That's so good. <laughs> yeah. So when you were at Marketo, you had certain things you had to do. And then you went on and you sold that to Adobe and you worked for a while for Adobe, right? Yeah. So, uh, three months. I, I, I don't, like, it's on my resume. I don't really count it. But, well, yeah. I would, yeah, I would have it there too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> each of these experiences was very different because you were dealing with very different size divisions. You were dealing with very different type of management, board structure, you, you just had a lot of different things to do. Like your job description was not the same in those three places from a very high level, just from an, for an entrepreneur tuning in, it's like wanting to know how different it is when you're day three at, at tout app to when you're in that three month stint at Adobe, is it absolute night and day or how does it evolve? Yeah. Um, 
the, so I, I learned this from Jason Lemkin. He had a post about this and it was really helpful when I was making that transition from CEO to uh, SVP of strategy. And uh, that's a tough change, just going from a small organization to a large organization. And he explained it so beautifully, mainly because he's gone through it. What he said was in a small organization, it's usually about command control structures. It's like, we need to do this, so you do this, 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 and this. And that's how you operate. And that's what's needed in a small unit. You're nimble, fast, and you set goals, and you just go crush them. Um, in a large organization, including Marketo, what I learned very quickly, like I had a lot of power because I reported to the CEO, and so people paid attention. But right. it still wasn't enough power. And even the CEO didn't have as much power. What you learned very quickly was it was less about command control. It was more about alignment. And you had to figure out what is that person's comp plan and what is this person and how do you get alignment around people and keep checking in on the alignment and keep driving it forward. And it was like a very subtle marination process to actually get things done. And, um, and learning that and embracing that uh, was crucial in being able to operate in a larger organization. Yeah, I love it. Uh, so a couple last questions that I want to ask is a little bit about what's, what's happening in 2020. What's, what's the landscape <laughs> like right now? <laughs> yeah. yeah, how much time do we have? Yeah. Um, a couple of interesting things are happening right now. Um, you know, you're, you've done a lot of talking about, you know, how entrepreneurs should position themselves. Um, obviously you're focused a lot on B2B, but do you think with what's happening out there right now, like, do you think, is this a lesson to entrepreneurs? Like, should we, should we be positioning ourselves for the next big thing that happens? Should we be positioning ourselves for the next big macro trend? Like, what do you think are the, are the lessons that we can learn from how quickly things have shifted? Because you have some companies that are right now J-curving just because of COVID-19, and you have some companies that, you know, will never be the same in a pretty negative way because of what's happening right now. Yeah. Is, is it a sign? Is it a wake-up call? Is it something with every, that everybody at the idea stage or early stage should be like, yeah, I got I to gotta do this better for the future? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I, I worry that I don't want to give an oversimplified answer, right? Because it, it could be very easy to do that. I, I think of it as, as, and this is true whether for right now or for six months from now or from six months ago. As a founder, uh, you always need to think about three scenarios. Uh, you need to think about what your worst case scenario is. Uh, you need to think about what your most likely case scenario is. Uh, you need to make sure you're well positioned to capture your most likely case scenario and protect for your worst case scenario. Once you've got all that locked down, you need to be looking at upside. And the great founders find a way to do all three uh, and make tough choices to optimize for the likely scenario as fast as possible and move quickly to take advantage of upsides as soon as they appear. Uh, that's it. Like, that's what it is. Is it easy to do? No. But the game of building startups is hard. And that's the, that's the bar. Um, and so I think that for any founder out there, what you want to be looking at, you need to be... Uh, what we are in right now is a period of higher volatility uh, versus six months ago. Right? Like, yeah, a lot of things change, but a lot of things are also changing really fast. So there's high volatility. What that means is you have to be, you have to be calculating your worst case scenario, your likely case scenario and upside faster and more often than more, uh, a better time than like maybe, you know, the peak of the stock market in 29, late 2019 or something. Right? Uh, at that point, you're like, all right, you maybe have to calculate once a quarter. Right now you have to calculate every month or every two weeks because things are changing so fast. But the, algorithm doesn't change i think what you need to say is what is my worst case what is my likely what is my upside and how do i take advantage of all three yeah yeah i worry that companies won't change enough fast enough 
just because they've never really had to like this quickly in some mm-hmm. industries. And I, I don't want to make any blanket statements either because basically no blanket statement is ever valid, but it just seems like there's a lot of companies that are really focused on, you know, on cash flow for the next few months and they should be right. Cause they need to survive, but you're focused on surviving today and they're going to be in a shittier spot tomorrow if they don't have these tough conversations with themselves and their, you know, their executive team and their board sooner than later, because I don't think it's, you know, I hate the phrase business as usual, but it's not right. Things will be different. Um, Whatever, whatever statistic you're putting in your pitch deck to raise your series a, that stat might be outdated now. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that it does come down to companies that are doing well now adapted very quickly. Um, and yeah. I, I don't know where I, where I read this, but I've said it so many times. I wish I could remember where, where I got it. Um, it's, it's like a market. They're like, look, you're going to need three marketing playbooks this year. What's the one you had in January? The one you had to constitute during quarantine and the one you have to constitute once you're coming out of it. You need three. And, and like, it's looking more likely that you might need four because of all the uh, riots right now uh, happening. The riot uh, playbook. Yeah. Uh, and, and the uncertainty that that brings and the new conversation that we're all in around that. Yeah. So, um, but it comes down to this high volatility. And because of its high volatility, you have to adapt faster. And yeah. if there's one blanket st- said, statement to be said, it's hope is not a strategy. So if you're sitting on a certain level of hope that it'll return to some normal or will regress, then that's probably where you should start to worry the most. Yeah. Um, Do you have any, like, are we learning anything from the businesses that are thriving right now? Is there, you know, is there a playbook or a framework that you've noticed in common with a bunch of the different startups that are kind of accelerating right now? Are they all, Are they all kind of doing the same thing? Is there something to learn from the pattern that we're seeing between the companies taking off? I mean, uh, the one thing that's about, that's true about COVID, not to get too philosophical, but COVID is the, has been the great equalizer. Uh, or, Or like if you were elderly it made you die faster. Uh, if you were already socially disadvantaged, it made you even more disadvantaged. If you were going to die as a company, it made you die faster. If you were doing well as a company, it made you do even better. Um, it's true. And, and, and amongst that, there's a whole bunch of, like, if, if there was injustice in your world, it got highlighted even more. That is the one thing that has happened consistently with COVID. Um, and, and so what can we learn from that principle is that the companies that are doing well are just getting the fundamentals right. They are essential. They are providing an essential service. They are providing real value. It's just the most well-run businesses are doing the best. Um, that's what I would say. That's a pretty good answer. I'll go with that too. Um, are you very, like you, your SaaS, your SaaS completely every day, all day, are, I know you're biased, but let's try not to be. Do you think that there is specifically a disproportionate amount of opportunities in SaaS right now? Um, and if you do think that, if I'm Luke, the founder that's trying to figure out something new to do, should I be specifically positioning to do well as a SaaS company? Or should I just build what I have and figure it out? Like, Should I skew what I'm doing towards SaaS because it's trending? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I, so I can give you a 45 minute pitch on why you should do a SaaS business and why they're amazing. And I, in fact, I do one every Sunday like <laughs> on my YouTube channel. Um, but you know, that's not the only opportunity in town, right? Uh, I think there are a lot of incredible opportunities. Um, one, one such opportunity is around uh, consumer communication, like how in a post COVID world, maybe social distancing is a thing for longer. Like how does that impact dating? How does that impact networking? How does that impact conferences? How does that impact events? 
So there's lots of macro trends that creates lots of different technology opportunities. Um, so if I were to give advice to a founder, I would look at macro opportunities second, and I would look at who I want to serve first. Like figure out who you want to serve, figure out which group of people that you know enough about to go impact them, figure out how you want to impact them, figure out what they need, then look at the macro trends then see if there's a solution to be had. I think that, um, you know, people that are like, oh, uh, mobile is a trend, so we should create a mobile app. It's like, okay, sure, but why you, why now, right? It, like, so I would go to first principle and like, what, what is it that you have that's an asset that you can go build off of? Yeah, yep, I like that a lot. Uh, one trend that's changing right now is stuff to deal with location right? You don't need to be in San Francisco as desperately now as a handful of months ago in order to build a scalable tech company. Um, I'm curious to know your thoughts about that. You're in a super cool place of Dallas, Texas. I got to hang out in Dallas and Austin and a bunch of cool small towns last summer. Some of the greatest few weeks of, uh, of my life, honestly. I was visiting with farmers, so I really got to see things yeah. um, and drive around. And I loved, I, I loved what was going on there. Um, you got your, your Silicon Valley areas. And then if we're going to call it Tier 2, and I'm saying that very lightly, we're talking about our, our Dallas, our Austins, our, you know, our Bostons, so have you. Do you think that... Like, should entrepreneurs be specifically trying to find opportunities to move to these markets because there's more action, because there's more venture capital, because it's just easier to scale for a bucket of different reasons? Or do you think that based on kind of what's happening right now in the world and how there's really talented people that are available anywhere and you don't have the expectation anymore to be in the same room, how do you think that dynamic has shifted? Yeah, I, I think that in, uh, you are more able to build a company anywhere else in the world. You don't have to be in Silicon Valley. And this is like, I moved to Silicon Valley. I, I started Tout in New York and, and then I moved to San Francisco. Uh, and so back then you had to do it. The capital was concentrated there. The partners were concentrated there. The talent was concentrated there. That's no longer true, even before COVID. That's number one. Number two is with all the massive layoffs that the big tech giants have done, uh, a study has shown that a mo overwhelming majority are outside of their headquarters. So it's in these quote unquote tier two cities where they let go of talent. So now there's even more well-trained talent in these cities that are going to be looking for new opportunities. Uh, and then the third thing is from a more of a lifestyle point of view, like I grew up in New York City. I lived the last nine years in San Francisco and I recently moved to Dallas, Texas. Every city does Brooklyn better than Brooklyn does right now. Uh, you can get your mm -hmm. fancy steakhouses, you have your, your uh, scotch bars, you have your, like all the things that you're like, oh, I need to be in a cool city. Like it, all these cities are just as cool. They have all, if not better, like I've been to certain cities where I'm like, wow, this is way cooler. And I heard to deal with a whole bunch of BS. So it's cool. Um, and so quality of life is also very important. Access to capital has, is getting more and more equalized now uh, because there are lots of capital uh, uh, that is seeking outside of the epicenter. Um, and there's more talent available. Um, there's better lifestyle available. Um, and I, I think that it's going to be very interesting to see where the next 10 really successful SaaS businesses emerge. Uh, over the next over the next 10 years. Yeah, and I'm also curious to know how they're structured. Will these be remote only? Will these be, you know, will, will they will they have an office, but will they, you know, will it be a remote work first? I'm curious yeah. to see how all that will shape out. So uh, I actually have a controversial view on this one. I think the death of the office is wildly exaggerated. <laughs> mm. I, I, I like human beings are ultimately social creatures. Yeah, I don't know about you, but um, like even with I I have my own SaaS business and my co-founder and I, we get so much more done when we're in a room together 
And, and so I find a lot of value in that. We probably over-indexed on the open office format 10 years ago. Yes. And we may ratchet that back. Uh, we may have more flexible work hours. But ultimately, businesses need to drive for performance and collaboration. And I think the office is still here to stay. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. I, I'm scared about what's happening right now because my favorite days at work are when I'm not at work. It's when I'm out with the customer, where I'm in the warehouse, where I'm on the front line, where I'm in the ambulance, like where I'm really where the action is. That's my favorite moments. And, you know, you build r rapport, you get them to tell you more stuff, you see more, and it helps to contextualize what it is that you're providing for them whole slew of benefits that come there that don't happen virtually. Um, there's some people that say, well, you know, Zoom is just going to get more advanced and we're all going to be like holograms and it'll be like, you know, Star Wars, but in the real world. In Star Wars, though, they still travel from planet to planet so they can, you know, talk face to face, table to table. And I think the same thing will happen here, right? We'll have the ability to do everything that we do now 80% as good virtually. Yeah, I think you'll have virtual trade shows. I think it makes sense. I agree with the, with the business case, right? It would be pretty cool to go to three trade shows in one day as opposed <laughs> to one. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't think it'll be like, no, nobody's going to go to a trade show anymore. I think it'll be like that, the underlying benefit and the people that do go and they do things how they do. The people that do go and bump into each other at the water cooler will always have that little bit of an edge. Yep. Yeah, that's the important thing to remember, right? Like if you're like, well, why do you think that? The reason I think that is right now, there's an equal playing field of everyone remote. Everyone's required to be remote. That breaks the minute, the minute you're trying to hop on a Zoom call where two people are in the same room and everyone else is on Zoom, it's like those two people already have an advantage. And if that, if one of those two people are this, is the CEO and everyone else is like a report to the CEO, boom, everyone's like gonna be rushing back to the office real fast. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> the, last, uh, the last question I wanna ask you, TK, is a double whammy, because I got a sort of a mixed audience here. Um, I know you love being surrounded by SaaS founders. I love being surrounded by entrepreneurs that have figured out how to find their first customer and are able to tell those stories. So we're having a good chat here. And the people that are listening, some of them have SaaS companies right now that are maybe between that, well, let's just call it between that one and 10 million um, range there in ARR. And they're trying to figure out how to get through COVID-19 because their lead volumes are down 70% or whatever. And then you also have the entrepreneur or you know, the SaaS startup that's just getting rolling. I want to know if you have like a parting message for each of those two types of groups that are pretty different. One of them has not found product market fit yet, but knows they want to start a SaaS business. And the other type has a SaaS company. Everything was starting to grow, but now they've had to scale back, you know, lay off a whole bunch of people and kind of reassess. How would you give each of those sort of some parting words of wisdom? Yeah, for the, uh, it's a great question. So for the, for the people that already have revenues that are looking to grow faster in a high volatility world, um, I would look to find the top 10% of their customers and their customer base, highest paying, lowest churn, highest LTV, most engaged, most success. Um, out of those, I would find the ones that are the larger ones and try to find 50, 100 more companies just like those. I would approach those companies with success stories about those original ones, and I would sell it to them at a much higher cost. I would raise prices. Mm. It um, seems like telling a good case study is such an underdone thing. Yeah, it's, it's an underdone thing uh, because it sounds obvious and, and they think it's like, I don't know, I, don't, I have no idea why it's so hard, but it's amazing when you do it. But more importantly, go up market, raise prices, and you will service a less number of customers, but you will make more money, you'll deliver more value, you'll have better quality customers, and out of that, you will get really great, you get more case studies that will help you go back to the lower end of the market when they start to buy again. Love it. Love it a lot. 
Uh, what what about the newbies on the opposite end of things that are kind of freaking out because the the water just got real rough? Yeah, for you guys, like it's uh, consider yourself blessed because if you figure out how to sell in this market, you will thrive when things get better. Uh, you are forced to show how you are going to make your clients more money or save them money or reduce risk. Those are three things that matter. It's one of those three things. Um, and so if you force yourself to do that and show that and orient yourself that way, you're set for the next 10 years to grow really well, regardless of market conditions. Yep. Beautiful. TK, people heard you talk today. They, they, they know who your friends are. They know where you hang out, but they want to spend more time with you. Um, what, what, what do you want to plug? People should be reading your book. I know that's one of them, but, uh, and I'm, I'm going to put that up on the screen here, but uh, maybe you want to, you want to share in one or two sentences what your book is about and the different ways that people can get in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what's the best way? So I, I wrote a book um, through my journey of leading tout app. Um, I learned that mindset is 50, 50% of it. So I created a set of strategies to scale as a founder in my personal life. Uh, and so I, I developed a very specific practice that I do to stay on top of the, the crazy game of SaaS. Um, and so you can go buy the book uh, on Amazon. It's how to punch the Sunday jitters in the face. We actually hit Amazon bestselling status. We've sold over 4,000 copies, bestseller in seven countries, 13 different categories. So it's been really amazing. Uh, so that you can do that. Um, if you want to learn about this practice, we teach founders to manage their mindset. You can go to getunstoppable.com. We have a web app that you can sign up for where we uh, guide you through doing it. Uh, super simple, super easy to do. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, we also run SaaS school. So if you are looking for coaching on getting to 10 million ARR um, and you have revenues and you want to go scale it, go to tkkato.com slash GTM, go to market. Um, and it's a natural like on ramp from everything that Luke does in his programs and support and community. So once you have product market fit, you have revenues, or you want to get to 10 million, we help you do that. So you can learn about that. Uh, and then just follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's at T A W H E E D. And I tweet about mindset and, um, and also I tweet about startups more than anything else. I got your LinkedIn here, not your Twitter, but uh, I'll make sure to tag it on the screen. Because yeah, you can also add me on LinkedIn. Yeah, and feel free to message me. Uh, I drop a video three times a week now, Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, so you can go to tkkater.com slash YouTube uh, and subscribe there. The only thing I ask is when you watch a video, smash that like button. It means the world to us. Smash the shit out of it. <laughs> and make sure you're supporting this guy. <laughs> Oh, that picture is so good. We, like, it's the most awkward picture. You can just tell we're all so, it, it's so good. I, uh, man, I love that. Picture. It looks like, the, like if the Silicon Valley TV show was inspired by something, it was this, right? We, we were the precursor. Yeah, like you have the token brown dude. You have the really tall dude. You have the really like, like very pragmatic dude. Like that's exactly, like we looked at that. I'm like, I can't believe, like, like it's so funny. Uh, so uh, good. Uh, uh, unreal. I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to chat today, TK. Anything else you want to share? Um, I'll share this one last thing because it, the picture reminded me. Uh, you know, sometimes people ask what is like, the, what was the best part about the journey so far? Uh, and, you know, you might like, you're going through war and you're building the product. Uh, it's 100% the people. Like the people I got to meet and make friends with and go to battle with and learn from and grow with, like these guys, we, we are still good lifelong friends. Uh, Pete is one of my closest friends. Um, uh, others through Tout App, like Steven, my co-founder right now for, for our Sunday application and the other businesses that we do, like just a, that's the best part. Like you meet such amazing people. Uh, so enjoy that because that's, I think, one of the biggest highlights. Like once you've sold the company, once you've counted the money, once you've bought your dream car, like all those things are fantastic. But, oh, my God, the people are 
unreal. That's the best part of it. I love it. I love it. So uh, you want to look at these inflection points. You want to go from zero to 1 million to 3 million, all the way up to 10 million and even 100 million. Maybe I can help you get to that first million bucks. But along the way, everybody go and check out TK. TK, I've really enjoyed getting to know you through our interactions on LinkedIn, on YouTube. It's been a real slice. I'm going to continue following and watching you. Let's look for future ways to collaborate and uh, really appreciate having this chat today, man. Absolutely. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Stay classy. We'll chat again soon. Thanks. See you later. Bye-bye.